Memoirs of a Revolutionary by Victor Serge. This is chapter three, part one of two. Anguish and, enth and Enthusiasm, 1919 to 1920. We were entering a world frozen to death. The Finland station, glittering with snow, was deserted. The square where Lenin had addressed a crowd from the top of an armored car was no more than a white desert surrounded by dead houses. The broad, straight thoroughfares, the bridges astride the Neva, now a river of snowy ice, seemed to belong to an abandoned city. First a gaunt soldier in a gray great coat, then after a long time a woman freezing under her shawls, went past like phantoms in an obvious silence. Towards the city center, gentle ghost-like hints of life began. Open sleds pulled by starving horses, proceeding unhurriedly over the white expanse. There were practically no cars. The rare passers-by, eaten by cold and hunger, had faces of ghastly white. Squads of half-ragged soldiers, their rifles often hanging from their shoulders by a rope, tramped around under the red pennants of their units. Palaces drowsed at the end of spacious prospects or before the frozen canals. Others, more massive, lorded it over yesterday's parade squares. The smart Baroque facades of the imperial family's residences were painted over an oxblood red. The theaters, the military headquarters, the former ministries, all in empire style, made a background of noble colonnades among huge stretches of emptiness. The high gilded dome of St. Isaac, upheld by mighty red granite pillars, hung over this wasting city like a symbol of past glories. We contemplated the low embr em embrasures of the Peter Paul Fortress and his golden spire, thinking of all the revolutionaries who, since Bakunin and Nikiev, had fought and now lay dead under those stones, that the world might belong to us. It was metropolis of cold, it was the metropolis of cold, of hunger, of hatred, and of, and of endurance. From about a million inhabitants, its population had now fallen in one year to scarcely 700,000 souls. At a reception center, we were issued with basic rations of black bread and dried fish. Never until now had any of us known such a hor horrid diet. Girls with red headbands joined with young, bespeckled agitators to give us a summary of the state of affairs. Famine, typhus, and counter-revolution everywhere. But the world revolution is bound to save us. They were surer of it than we were, and our doubts made them momentarily suspicious of us. All they asked us was whether Europe would soon be kindled. What is the French proletariat waiting for before it seizes power? The Bolshevik leaders that I saw spoke to me in more or less the same tones. Zinoviev's wife, Lilina, People's Commissar for Social Planning in the Northern Commune, a small crop-haired grey-eyed woman in a uniform jacket, sprightly and tough, asked me, Have you brought your families with you? I could put them up in places, which I know is very nice on some occasions. But it is impossible to hear them, to heat them, sorry. You'd better go to Moscow. Here we are besieged people in a city under siege. Hunger riots may start, the Finns may swoop on us, the British may attack. Typhus has killed so many people that we can't manage to bury them. Luckily, they are frozen. If work is what you want, there's plenty of it. And she told me passionately of the Soviet achievement, school building, children's centers, relief for pensioners, free medical assistance, the theaters open to all. We work on in spite of everything and we shall carry on working till our last hour. Later I was to learn at first hand how hard she worked, never showing any sign of being worn down. Shlovsky, People's Commissar for Foreign Affairs in the Northern Commune, an intellectual with a black beard and a jaundiced complexion met me in a room of what was lately military headquarters. What are they saying about us abroad? They're saying that Bolshevism equals banditry. There's something in that, he replied calmly. You'll see for yourself things are too much for us. 
In the revolution, the revolutionaries only amount to a very tiny percentage. He outlined the situation to me, sparing nothing. A revolution dying, strangled by, by blockade, ready to collapse from inside into the chaos of counter-revolution. He was a man of bitterly clear vision. He committed suicide around 1930. Zinoviev, the president of the Soviet, by contrast affected an, an extraordinary confidence. Clean-shaven, pale, his face a little puffy, he felt absolutely at home on the pinnacle of power, being the most long-standing of Lenin's collaborators in the Central Committee. All the same, there was also an impression of flabbiness, almost of a lurking irresolution emanating from his whole personality. Abroad, a frightful reputation for terror surrounded his name. I told him this. Of course, he answered smiling, they don't like our plebeian methods of fighting. And he alluded to the latest delegation from the consular corps who were making representations to him in favor of the hostages taken from the bourgeoisie. He sent them about their business. If it was we who were being shot, these gentlemen would be quite happy, wouldn't they? Our conversation turned principally on the state of mass feeling in the Western countries. I kept saying that tremendous events were, ma were maturing, only the process was sluggish, halting, and blind, and that in France, more particularly, no revolutionary upheaval was to be expected for a long time. Zinoviev smiled with an air of kindly cond condescension. It is easy to tell that you are no Marxist. History cannot stop halfway. Maxim Gorky welcomed me affectionately. In the famished years of his youth, he had been acquainted with my mother's family at Nizhny Novgorod. His apartment in the Kron Kronversky Prospect, full of books and Chinese objets d'art, seemed as warm as a greenhouse. He himself was chilly even under his thick gray sweater and coughed terribly, the result of his 30-year struggle against tuberculosis. Tall, lean, and bony, broad-shouldered, and hollow-chested, he, he stooped a little as he walked. His frame, sturdily built but anemic, appeared essentially as a support for his head. An ordinary Russian man in the street's head, bony and pitted, really almost ugly with its jutting cheekbones, great thin-lipped mouth, and professional smeller's nose, broad and peaked. His complexion deathly, he was chewing away under his short, bristly moustache, full of dejection, or rather of anguish, mingled with indignation. His bushy brows puckered readily, and his big grey eyes held an extraordinary wealth of expression. His whole being expressed hunger for knowledge and human understanding, determination to probe all inhuman doings to their depths, never stopping at mere appearances, never tolerating any lies told to him, and never lying to himself. I saw him immediately as the supreme, the righteous, the relentless witness of the revolution, and it was as such that he talked with me. He spoke harshly about the Bolsheviks. They were drunk with authority, cramping the violent, spontaneous anarchy of the Russian people and starting bloody, de bloody despotism all over again. All the same, they were facing chaos alone with some incor incorruptible men in their leadership. His observations always started from facts, from chilling anecdotes upon which he would base his well-considered generalizations. The prostitutes were sending a delegation to him demanding the right to organize a trade union. The entire work of a scholar who had devoted his whole life to the study of religious sects had been stupidly confiscated by the Cheka and then stupidly transported across the city through the snow, and a whole cartload of documents and manuscripts was perishing on a deserted quay because the horse was dying of hunger. By chance, some students brought a few bundles of precious manuscripts to Alexei Max Maximovich Gorky. The fate of the hostages in the jails was nothing short of monstrous. Hunger was weakening the masses and distorting the cerebral processes of the whole country. This socialist revolution was rising from the greatest depths of barbaric old Russia. The countryside was systematically pillaging the city, demanding something, even if it were useless, in exchange for every handful of flour brought clandestinely into the city by the musics. 
They were taking gilded chairs, candelabras, and even pianos back to their villages. I've even seen them carrying streetlights. At present, it was imperative to side with the revolutionary regime for fear of a rural counter-revolution which would be nothing less than an outburst of savagery. Alexei Maximovich spoke to me of strange tortures rediscovered for the benefit of commissars in remote country districts, such as pulling out the intestines through an incision in the abdomen and coiling them slowly around a tree. He thought that the tradition of these tortures was kept up through the reading of the Golden Legend. The non-communist, i.e. anti-Bolshevik intellectuals, by far the great majority whom I saw gave me more or less the same general picture. They thought of Bolshevism as finished, consumed by famine and terror, opposed by all the peasants of the countryside, all the intelligentsia, and the great majority of the working class. The people who spoke thus to me were socialists who had been enthusiastic participants in the March 1917 revolution. The Jews among them were living in terror of approaching pogroms. All of them expected chaos replete with massacres. The doctrinal follies of Lenin and Trotsky will have to be paid for. Bolshevism is nothing but a corpse, according to an engineer who had studied at Liège. All that it has to be decided is who will be its gravedigger. The dissolution of the, con of the Constituent Assembly in certain crimes at the beginning of the revolution, such as the execution or murder of the Hingley's brothers and the murder in hospital of the liberal de deputies Shingarev and Kokoshkin, had left a wake of enraged resentment. The violent acts of mob agitators such as the Kronstadt sailors so offended the humane feelings of men of goodwill that they lost all their critical faculties. Against how many hangings, humiliations, ruthless repressions, threatened reprisals did these excesses have to be set? If the other side won, would it be any more merciful? Besides, what were the whites doing in the areas where they ruled the roost? I moved among intellectuals who wept for their dream of an enlightened democracy governed by a sagacious parliament and inspired by an enlightened democracy governed by a sagacious parliament, oh, sorry, <laughs> governed by a sagacious parliament and inspired by an idealistic press, their own, of course. Every conversation I had with them convinced me that, face to face with the ruthlessness of history, they were wrong. I saw that their cause of democracy had, at the end of the summer of 1917, stood between two fires, that is to say, between two conspiracies, and it seemed obvious to me that, if the Bolshevik insurrection had not taken power at that point, the cabal of the old generals, supported by the officers' organizations, would have certainly done so instead. Russia would have avoided the Red Terror only to endure the White and a proletarian dictatorship only to undergo a reactionary one. In consequence, the most outrageous observation of the anti-Bolshevik intellectuals only revealed to me how necessary Bolshevism was. Moscow, with its old Italian and Byzantine architecture, its innumerable churches, its snows, its human ant heap, its great public departments, its half-clandestine markets, wretched, wretched, but color, wretched but colorful, taking up vast squares, Moscow, Moscow seemed to live a little better than Petrograd. Here, committees were piled on top of councils and managements on top of commissions. Of this apparatus, which seemed to me to function largely in a void, wasting three quarters of its time on unrealizable projects, I at once formed the worst possible impression. Already in the midst of general misery, it was nurturing a multitude of bureaucrats who were responsible for more fuss than honest work. In the offices of commissariats, one came across elegant gentlemen, pretty and irreproachably powdered typists, chic uniforms weighed down with decorations, and everybody in this smart set, in such contrast with the famished populace in the streets, kept sending you back and forth from office to office for the slightest matter and without the slightest result. I witnessed members of government, circles, driven to telephoning Lenin to obtain a railway ticket or a room in the hotel, i.e. the house of the Soviets. 
The Central Committee's Secretariat gave me some tickets for lodgings, but I got none, because initiation into the racket was more necessary than any ticket. I met the Menshevik leaders and certain anarchists. Both sets denounced Bolshevik intolerance, the stubborn refusal to revolutionary dissenters of any right to exist, and the excesses of the terror. Neither group, however, had any substantial alternative to suggest. The Mensheviks were publishing a daily paper, which was widely read. They had recently announced their allegiance to the regime and recovered their legality. They demanded the abolition of the Cheka and sang the praises of a return to Soviet democracy. One anarchist group canvassed the idea of a federation of free communes. Others saw no future except in fresh insurrections, although realizing that famine was blocking all possible progress in the revolution. I learned that, around the autumn of 1918, the anarchist black guards had felt powerful enough for their leaders to discuss whether or not they should seize Moscow. Novo, Novo Mirsky and Borovoy had won the majority over to the virtues of abstention. We would not know what to do about the famine, they said. Let it exhaust the Bolsheviks and lead the dictatorship of the commissars to its grave. Then our hour will come. The Mensheviks seemed to me to be admirably intelligent, honest, and devoted to socialism, but completely overtaken by events. They stood for a sound principle, that of working class democracy, but a situation such as the state of siege fraught with, mu with such mortal danger did not permit any functioning of democratic institutions. And their bitterness arising out of their brutal defeat as the party of compromise disfigured their thinking. Since they waited on the coming of some catastrophe, their declaration of support for the regime was only lip service. They were further compromised by the fact that in 1917 they had supported governments that had failed to carry out agrarian reform and had failed to impede the military counter-revolution. Of the Bolshevik leaders, on this occasion in Moscow, I saw only Aveli Yanukids, secretary of the executive committee of the All-Union Soviets, actually the key post in the Repub Republic's government. He was a fair-headed Georgian with a kind, sturdy face, lit up by blue eyes. His bearing was corpulent and grand, that of a mountain dweller born and bred. He was affable, humorous, and realistic striking the same note as the Bolsheviks in Petrograd. Our bureaucracy's a scandal, no doubt about it. I think Petrograd is healthier. I even advise you to settle down there unless you are too scared of Petrograd's peculiar dangers. Here we, become, here we combine all the vices of the old Russia with those of the new. Petrograd is an outpost, the front line. While talking about bread and tinned food, I asked him, do you think we will hold out? Sometimes I feel like I'm from another planet and think the revolution is in its death throes. He burst out laughing. That's because you don't know us. We are infinitely stronger than we seem. Gorky offered me employment with him in the Petrograd Publishing House Universal Literature, but the only people I met there were aging or embittered intellectuals trying to escape from the present by retranslating Boccaccio, Nuthamson, or Balzac. My mind was made up. I was neither against the Bolsheviks nor neutral. I was with them, albeit independently, without renouncing thought or critical sense. It would have been easy for me to pursue careers in government, but I decided to avoid them and also, as far as possible, jobs that required the exercise of authority. Others seemed to so enjoy them that I thought I could legitimately afford this obviously wrong-headed... Um, attitude. Um, I would support the Bolsheviks because they were doing what was necessarily tenaciously, doggedly, with magnificent ardor and a calculated passion. I would be with them because they alone were carrying this one out, taking all responsibilities on themselves, all the initiatives, and were demonstrating an astonishing strength of spirit. Certainly on several essential points, they were mistaken in their intolerance, in their faith and satisfaction, in their leaning towards centralism and administrative techniques. 
But given that one had to counter them with freedom of the spirit and the spirit of freedom, it must be with them and among them. Possibly, after all, these evils had been impelled by civil war, blockade, and famine, and if we managed to survive, the remedy would come of itself. I remember having written in one of my first letters from Russia that I was resolved to make no career out of the revolution, and, once the mortal danger has passed, to join again with those who will fight the evils of the new regime. I was on the staff of the Severnaya Commune, Northern Commune, the organ of the Petrograd Soviet, an instructor in the public education clubs, organizing inspector for schools in the second district, lecturing assistant to the Petrograd militia, etc. People were in short supply and I was overwhelmed with work. All this activity brought me the means of bare existence from one day to the next, in a chaos that was oddly organized. The militiamen to whom I gave evening glance, er, classes in history and the first elements of political science, or political grammar as it was called, would offer me a cob of black bread and a herring if the lesson had been in interesting. Happy to ask me endless questions, they would escort me after the lesson through the shadows of the city, right up to my lodgings, in case anyone should steal my precious little parcel. And we would all trip over the carcass of a horse, dead in the snow in front of the opera house. The Third International had just been founded in Moscow. It was now March 1919, and had appointed Zinoviev as president of its executive. The proposal was actually Lenin's. The new executive still possessed neither personnel nor offices. Although I was not a member of the party, Zinoviev asked me to organize his administration. As my knowledge of Russian life was too limited, I was unwilling to assume such a responsibility by myself. After some days, Zinoviev told me, I've found an excellent man. You'll get along with him really well. And so it turned out. It was thus that I came to know Vladimir Os Osipovich Mazin, who prompted by the same motives as myself had just joined the party. Through its severely practical centralization of power and its repugnance towards individualism and celebrity, the Russian Revolution has left in obscurity at least as many first-rate men as it is made famous. Of all these great but still practically unknown figures, Mazin seems to me to be the, one of the most remarkable. One day in an enormous room in the Smolny Institute, furnished solely with a table and two chairs, we met face to face, both of us rigged rigged out rather than rather absurdly. I still wore a large sheepskin hat that had been a present from a Cossack and a short, shabby overcoat, the garb of the Western unemployed. Mazin wore an old blue uniform with worn out elbows. He had a three days growth of beard. His eyes were encircled by old fashioned spec spectacles of white metal. His face was elongated, his brow lofty, and his complexion pasty from starvation. Well, he said to me, so were the executive of the New International. It's really ridiculous. And upon that bare table, we set about drawing rough sketches of seals, for a seal was required immediately for the president. The great seal of the world revolution, no more, no less. We decided that the globe would be the emblem on it. We were friends with the same points of concern, doubt, and confidence, spending any moments spared us from our grinding work in examining together the problems of authority, terror, centralization, Marxism, and heresy. We both had strong leanings towards heresy. I was beginning my initiation into Marxism. Mazin had arrived there through the path of personal experience in jail. With those convictions, he combined an old-fashioned libertarian heart and an ascetic temperament. As an adolescent in 1905 on the revolutionary day of January 22nd, he had seen the St. Petersburg streets running with the blood of working-class petitioners, and at once decided, even while the Cossacks were clearing away the crowd with their stubby whips, to study the chemistry of explosives. He very soon became one of the chemists of the maximalist group who wanted a total socialist revolution. He, Vladimir 
Osipovich Lichtenstead, son of a good liberal bourgeois family, manufactured the bombs that went with three of his comrades who presented themselves dressed as officers on August 12th, 1906, at a gala entertainment for the Prime Minister Stolopin, and who, in blowing up the house, blew themselves up too. Sometimes afterwards, the Maximalists attacked a treasury van in the broad daylight of St. Petersburg. Lichtenstadt was condemned to death, then pardoned. He spent 10 years in prison at Schlüsselburg, much of it in the same cell as the Georgian Bolshevik Sergo, oh boy, Ordsonikids, who was to become one of the organizers of Soviet industrialization. In confinement, Lichtenstadt wrote a book of scientific meditation that was later published um, called Go Within the Philosophy of Nature and studied Marx. One morning in March 1917, the prisoners of Schlüsselberg were called to the courtyard by the guards bearing weapons. They believed they were going to be slaughtered. They could hear the cries of a furious crowd surrounding the prison walls. Actually, this crowd was deliriously joyful. It broke down the doors, the blacksmiths with their tools at the head to break the prisoners' chains. It was the prisoners who had to protect their guards. On the day he got out of prison, Lichtenstadt and the anarchist Justin Juke had to take charge of the administration of the town of Schlüsselberg. After, after the death and battle of another prisoner, a friend whom he admired, Lichtenstadt adopted the dead man's name and called himself Mazin to remain faithful to his example. As a Marxist, he was at first a Menshevik because of his zeal for democracy and then entered the Bolshevik party to be on the side of those who were the most active, the most creative, and the most imperiled. He had a consuming interest in great books, a scholar's soul, a childlike frankness in the face of evil, and few basic wants. For 11 years, he had been waiting to see his wife again. She was at present separated from him by the Southern Front. The faults in the revolution, he would say to me over and over again, must be fought in the realm of action. We spent our lives among telephones, trailing around the huge dead city in wheezy motor cars, commandeering print shops, selecting staff, correcting proofs even in the trams, bargaining with the Board of Trade for string, and with the state bank's printers for paper, running to the Cheka or to the distant suburban prisons whenever, which was every day. We were notified of some abomination, fatal mistake, or a piece of cruelty in conferring with Zinoviev in the evening. Since we were senior officials, we lived in the Hotel Astoria, the foremost house of the Soviets, where the most responsible of the party's militants resided under the protection of machine guns posted on the ground floor. Through the black market, I came into possession of a fur-lined riding jacket, which, cleared of its fleas, made me look wonderful. In the former Austro-Hungarian embassy, we found some ha Habsburg officers' clothes in excellent condition for some of the comrades on our new staff. We were enormously privileged, although the bourgeoisie, dispossessed and now addicted to every imaginable form of speculation, lived much better than we did. Every day at the table reserved for the northern commune executive, we found gr greasy soup and often a ration of slightly high but still delicious horse meat. The customary diners there were Zinoviev, Yevdokimov uh, Yev Yev from the Central Committee, Zorin from the Petrograd Committee, Bakiev, President of the Cheka, sometimes Helena Stasova, Secretary of the Central Committee, and sometimes Stalin, who was practically unknown. <laughs> Zinoviev occupied an apartment on the first floor of the Astoria. As an extraordinary privilege, this hotel of dictators was kept almost warm and was lit brightly at nightfall since work there never stopped and thus it formed an enormous vessel of light above the dark public squares. Rumor endowed us with incredible comfort and even detailed our alleged orgies, with actresses from the corps de ballet, naturally. All this time, Bakiev of the Cheka was going around with holes in his boots. 
In spite of my special rations as a government official, I would have died of hunger without the sordid manipulations of the black market, where we traded the petty possessions we had brought in from France. The eldest son of my friend Yonov, Zinoviev's brother-in-law, an executive member of the Soviet and founder and director of the State Library, died of hunger before our very eyes. All this while we were looking after considerable stocks and even riches. But on the state's behalf and under rigorous control, something that our subordinates never ceased to mock us over. Our salaries were limited to the communist maximum equal to the average wage of a skilled worker. During this period, the old Lettish Bolshevik and Soviet delegate Peter Stuchka, a great figure now forgotten, instituted a strictly egalitarian regime in which the party committee was also the government. Its, mem its members were forbidden to enjoy any material privileges at all. Vodka was banned, though the comrades obtained it clandestinely from peasants, who through home distilling extracted a terrifying alcohol from corn, 80 proof. I remember only one orgy, which I happened upon in a room in the Astoria during a night of danger, where my friends, all heads of sections, were drinking this fiery liquid in silence. On the table was a huge tin of tuna captured from the English somewhere in the forests of Shenkirk, Shenkursk and brought back by a fighter. Sweet and oily, this fish seemed to us a heavenly food. All that blood made us depressed. The telephone became my personal enemy. Perhaps it is for that reason that I still feel a stubborn aversion to it. At every hour, it brought me voices of panic-stricken women who spoke of arrests, imminent executions, and injustice, and begged me to intervene at once, for the love of God. Since the first massacres of red prisoners by the whites, the murders of Volod Volodarsky, and Uritsky, and the attempt against Lenin in the summer of 1918, the custom of arresting and often executing hostages had become generalized and legal. Already, the Cheka, the Extraordinary Commission for Repression Against Revolution, or against counter revolution, <laughs> speculation, and desertion, which made mass arrests of suspects, was tending to settle their fate independently under formal control of the under formal control by the party, but in reality without anybody's knowledge. It was becoming a state within the state, protected by military secrecy and proceedings in camera. The party endeavored to head it with in incorruptible men like the former convict Zertzinski, a sincere idealist, ruthless but chivalrous, with the emaciated profile of an inquisitor. Tall forehead, bony nose, untidy goatee, an expression of weariness and austerity. But the party had few men of this stamp and many Chekas. These gradually came to select their personnel by virtue of their psychological inclinations. The only temperaments that devoted themselves willingly and tenaciously to this task of internal defense were those characterized by suspicion, embitterment, harshness, and sadism. Long-standing social inferiority complexes and memories of humiliations and suffering in the SARS jails rendered them intractable, and since professional degeneration has rapid effects, the Chekas inevitably consisted of perverted men tending to see conspiracy everywhere and to live in the midst of perpetual conspiracy themselves. I believe that the formation of the Chekas was one of the gravest and most impermissible errors that the Bolshevik leaders committed in 1918 when plots, blockades, and interventions made them lose their heads. All evidence indicates that revolutionary tribunals, functioning in the light of day without excluding secret sessions in particular cases, and admitting the right of defense, would have attained the same efficiency with far less abuse and depravity. Was it so necessary to revert to the procedures of the Inquisition? By the, by the beginning of 1919, the Chekas had little or no resistance against this psychological perversion and corruption. I know for a fact that Zerzinski judged them to be half rotten and saw no solution to the evil except in shooting the worst Czechists 
and abolishing the death penalty as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, the terror went on, since the whole party was living in the sure inner knowledge that they would be massacred in the event of defeat. And defeat remained possible from one week to the next. In every prison, there were quarters reserved for Czechists, judges, police of all sorts, informers, and, and executioners. The executioners who used Negan revolvers generally ended by being executed themselves. They would begin to drink, to wander around, and fire unexpectedly at anybody, and was acquainted with several cases of this sort. I was also closely acquainted with the terrible Chudin case, still young though a revolutionary of 1905 vintage. Chudin, a tall curly-headed lad who, whose roguish stare was softened by his pince nez, had fallen in love with a girl he had met at a class. She became his mistress. A number of swindlers exploited his sincerity by prevailing on him to intercede for some genuine speculators, more than mere suspects, whose release they thus obtained. Zerzinski had Chudin and his girl, and the swindlers all shot. No one doubted Chudin's honesty. There was bitter dismay all round. Years later, comrades said to me, on that day we shot the best man among us. They never forgave themselves. Fortunately, the democratic manners of the party were still strong enough to enable militants to intercede fairly easily with the Cheka against certain blunders. It was all the easier for me to do this since the leaders of the Cheka lived at the Astoria, including Ivan Bakiev, president of the Extraordinary Commission. Bakiev was a handsome fellow of about 30 with the careless appearance of a Russian village accordion player. Indeed, he liked to wear a smock with an embroidered collar and colored border, just like such a player. In the performance of his frightful duty, he exercised an impartial will and a scrupulous vigilance. I saved several people, although once I failed, in circumstances that were both cruel and ridiculous. This concerned an officer named, I think, Nestorenko, a fresh woman's husband, who was arrested at Kronstadt in connection with the Lindquist conspiracy. Bakiev promised me that he would personally review the dossier. When I met him again, he smiled. Is, it isn't serious. I'll soon have him released. I took pleasure in disclosing this good news to the suspect's wife and daughter. A few days later, I met Bakiev, passing from room to room in the Smolny, joking as he loved to. When he saw me, his face grew pale. Too late, Victor... Too late, Victor... Lovovich. While I was away, they shot the poor devil. He went past to his next business, spreading his hands wide in a gesture of powerlessness. Shocks of this kind did not happen often, but the terror was too much for us. I arranged the release of a distant relative, a subaltern confined as a hostage in the Peter Paul Fortress. He came to me to tell me that they had failed to give him back his papers on his discharge. Go and ask for them back, I said. Off he went, only to return thunderstruck. An official whispered me in answer. Don't press for it. You've been reported shot for the last ten days. He gave up bothering about the matter. Often at the Cheka, I would meet the man whom I came to dub mentally as the great interceder, Maxim Gorky. His efforts tormented Zinoviev and Lenin, but he nearly always got his way. In cases that were difficult, I approached him, and he never refused to intervene. But although he was working for the journal Communist International, not without violent arguments with Zinoviev over some wording in every article he wrote, he once greeted me with a kind of roaring fury. On that day, it was coming from a discussion with Zinoviev. Gorky shouted out, Don't ever talk to me of that swine ever again. Tell me that his torturers are a disgrace to the human form. 
Their quarrel lasted until Petrograd underwent its new phase of mortal peril. Mortal, sorry, mortal peril. The spring of 1919 opened with events at once expected and surprising. At the beginning of April, Munich acquired a Soviet regime. On March 22nd, Hungary quietly became a Soviet republic through the abdication of Count Karolyi's bourgeois government, Belikun, who had been sent to a Budapest, who had been sent to Budapest by Lenin and Zinoviev, came out of jail to take power. The bad news from the civil war fronts lost their importance. Even the fall of Munich, captured by General Hoffmann on May 1st, seemed rather unimportant by comparison with the revolutionary victories now expected to follow in Central Europe, Bohemia, Italy, and Bulgaria. However, the massacres at Munich did reinforce the terrorist state of mind and the atrocities committed at Ufa by Admiral Kolchak's troops who burned red prisoners alive, had lately enabled the Czechists to prevail against those party members who hoped for a greater degree of humanity. The executive of the international was in session at Moscow with Angela, Angelica Bella, Bella Bonova in charge of the secretariat. Actually, its political control was managed from Petrograd by Zinoviev, with whom Karl Radek and Bukharin used to come and confer. The executive held a session also at Petrograd. This was attended by Finns, e.g. Sirola, Bulgarians, the ambassador from Soviet Hungary, Rudniansky, and the Volga German Klinger. I was present at these meetings, although I had still not joined the party. I remember that the anarchist William Shatov, for a short while, the military governor of the old capital and later the real leader of the 10th Army, was also invited. There, the superiority of the Russians compared with the foreign revolutionaries amazed me. It was immediately obvious. I found Zinoviev's optimism terrifying. He seemed to have no doubts at all. The European revolution was on the way and nothing would stop it. I can see him now, at the end of the session, his fingertips playing with the little tassels of silken cord, which he wore instead of a tie, wreathed in smiles, and saying about some resolution or other, always provided that new revolutions do not come and upset our plans for the forthcoming weeks. He was setting the tone. Actually, we were a hair breadth from the disaster. A regiment on the Estonian front betrayed us. In other words, its officers took it over to the enemy side, but their epaulets back on put their epaulets back on and hanged the communists. Other officers, also joining the enemy, seized Krasnaya Gorka, one of the forts that dominated the western defenses of Petrograd. A message announced the fall of Kronstadt, falsely, at the Smolny, at the Astoria, in the committees. We had this sudden feeling of disaster and no escape possible except on foot by road as the railway had no fuel whatsoever. One moment of panic in Petrograd would have collapsed. There was panic, but not in the normal sense. It was about holding on at all costs or how to sell our hides as dearly as possible. Quite literally, we lacked everything and the morale in the city was lamentably low. A party committee asked me one day to make a speech before some sailors at the fleet depot. Why are you asking me to speak when any of you could do it, and better than me? Because you're a runt. In these conditions, they won't attack you, and also your French accent will appeal to them. The soldiers and sailors often booed down party speakers for whose benefit they had invented a comic ritual. The speakers would be sat in a wheelbarrow and taken around the camp on the accompaniment of jeering and whistling. Nothing happened to me. I was too skinny to be wheelbarrowed. The sailors heard me out in relative silence. On the walls of the depot, graffiti mocked Lenin and Trotsky. Dried fish and shitty bread. All in capital letters. As if more terror was required, the Central Committee sent us Peters, who briefly took command of the place, and Stalin, who went to inspect the front. Peters was preceded by a sinister reputation. 
a young let with the head of a blonde bulldog, and with the reputation of a merciless executioner, having grown up in the climate of a repression of the Baltic countries. He had the look of his profession, reserved, sullen, aloof, but I heard him tell only one story, and this fitted ill with his deserved reputation. During one of those bad nights which preceded an even more awful dawn, he had phoned the Peter Paul Fortress. The officer in charge picked up the receiver, completely drunk. Peters was outraged. That Grisha made me furious. I should have had him shot right away, drunk on duty, and at such a moment. I screamed at him and it took me ages to calm down again. At the executive's table I saw Stalin, a slim cavalry officer, slightly slanting brown eyes, mustache trimmed to the lips, trying to catch Zinoviev's attention frightening and banal, like a Caucasian dagger. The nights were white and the weather superb. Towards one in the morning, a faint bluish light lay over the canals, the neva, the golden spires of the palaces, and the empty squares with their equestrian statues of dead emperors. I went to bed in guard houses and did my turn of sentry duty in outlying railway stations, reading Alexander Herzen. Quite a few of us sentries took books with us, I searched people's homes. House by house, we sifted apartments, looking for arms and white agents. I could have easily avoided this unpleasant work, but I went, but I went off to it with a will, knowing that wherever I went, no brutality, thefts, or stupid arrests would take place. I remember a weird exchange of shots on the roofs of high buildings overlooking a sky-blue canal. Men fled before us, firing the revolvers at us from behind the chimney pots. I kept slipping on the sheet iron roof and my heavy rifle dragged on me frightfully. The men we were after escaped, but I treasured an unforgettable vision of the city, seen at 3 a.m. in all its magical paleness. The city was saved mainly through Grigory Yevdokimov an ex-seafarer, vigorous and gray-haired, with a music's roughness. Loud of voice, fond of the bottle, he never seemed to admit that a situation was hopeless, when it seemed impossible for the moscow Petrograd Railway to operate. Since there was no more than two days' supply of dry wood, I heard him exclaim, Well, they can chop down wood on the way. The journey will be done in 20 hours, no more. He was the organizer of the city's second line of defense, where the gun batteries were lined up by young girls from the Communist Party. The actual operations leading to the sailors' capture of the fort of Krasnaya Gorka were directed by Bill Shatov. I was present at a private meeting in his room at the Astoria, which concerned the best method of using the crews of the fleet. Shatov explained that these merry youngsters were the best fed in the garrison, the best accommodated, and the most appreciated by pretty girls, to whom they could now and then slip a tin of food. Consequently, none of them was agreeable to fighting for more than a few hours, being concerned to get a comfortable sleep on board ship. Someone suggested that once they were disembarked, the ships should be sent away on some plausible pretext. They would then have to hold the front for 24 hours, having no further means of retreat. How did Bill Shatov manage to keep his rotundity and good humor? He was the only fat man among us with a remarkable face, like an American businessman's, clean-shaven and fleshy. Working class converted to anarchism by exiles in Canada, of a lively and decisive organizer, he was the real leader of the 10th Red Army. Every time he returned from the front, he loaded us with anecdotes, such as the tale of a certain small town mayor who, mistaking the Reds for the Whites and Shatov's himself for a, a colonel, had come to him in the thick of the gunfire to present a complimentary address, specially written for the occasion. Bill knocked him down on the spot. Just imagine the idiot had his big medallion from the Tsar hung around his neck. Later, in 1929 or so, Shatov became one of the builders of the Turkestan Siberia Railway. Two episodes from these moments come to mind. The vast, deserted anterooms of the Smolny. The International Services 
got on with their work as best they could. I was in my office with, when Zinoviev entered, running his fingers through his hair, his gesture when he was worried. What's the matter, Grigory Yevsevich? The English have landed not far from the border with Estonia. We have nothing to fight them with. Write a few leaflets for me immediately for the troops we are deploying, stirring, direct, and short. Okay? It's our strongest weapon. I wrote these leaflets, had them printed right away in three different languages, and our best weapon was ready. Luckily, it was a false alarm. But generally speaking, it has to be said that propaganda was very effective. We used a simple and truthful language for men who, when deployed, often did not understand why they were being sent to fight again only wanted to go home, and to whom no one had ever addressed such basic truths. The Great War had been fought with idiotic propaganda that was daily bellied by events. We learned of a disaster, three red destroyers, had just been sunk in the Gulf of Finland, either by the English or by a minefield. The crews of the fleet commemorated the sacrifice of their drowned comrades who died for the revolution. Then we discovered, secretly, that they had perished in an act of betrayal. The three destroyers were going over to the enemy when a wrong course took them into a minefield. It was decided to keep quiet. For several months, we experienced a lull. The summer brought us inexpressible relief. Even the famine was a little diminished. I made frequent journeys to Moscow. Its circular, leafy boulevards were filled in the evening with a buzzing, amorous crowd dressed in bright colors. There was very little illumination at nightfall, and the hum of the crowd could be heard from far away in the twilight and afterwards in the darkness. Soldiers from the Civil War, girls from the old bourgeoisie who packed the Soviet offices during the day, refugees from the massacres in the Ukraine, were nationalist bands, where national bands were systematically slaughtered, slaughtering the Jewish population, men wanted by the Cheka, plotting in broad daylight two steps from the torture cellars, imagist, poets, and futurist painters. All of them could be seen scurrying to live. In Tverskaya Street, there were several poets' cafes. It was the time when Sergei Yesenin was becoming famous sometimes writing his splendid poetry in chalk on the walls of the now secularized Monastery of the Passion. I met him in a seedy cafe, overpowdered, overpainted women, leaning on the marble slabs, cigarettes between their fingers, drank coffee made from roasted oats, men clad in black leather, frowning and tight-lipped, with heavy revolvers at their belts, had their arms around the women's waists. These fellows knew what it was to live rough, knew the taste of blood, the odd, painful impact of a bullet in the flesh, and it all made them appreciative of the poems, incanted and almost sung, whose violent images jostled each other as thought in a fight. Or as though in a fight. <laughs> when I saw Yesenin for the first time, I disliked him. 24 years old, he mixed with the women, ruffians, and ragamuffins, from the dark corners of Moscow. A drinker, his voice was harsh, his horse, his eyes worn, his handsome young face puffed and polished, his golden blonde hair flowing in waves around his temples. He was surrounded by sheer glory. The old symbolist poets recognized him as an equal. The intelligentsia claimed his slim volumes and the folk of the street sang his poems. He deserved all of it. Dressed in a white silk smock, he would mount the stage and begin to declaim. The affectation, the calculated elegance, the alcoholic's voice, the puffy face, everything prejudiced, me against him, and the atmosphere of a decomposing bohemianism, entangling its homosexuals and exotics with our militants, all but disgusted me. Yet, like everyone like everyone else, I yielded in a single instant to the positive sorcery of that ruined voice, of a poetry that came from the inmost depths of the man and the age. 
Coming from there, I used to stop in front of the glass cases, some of them with long cracks from last year's bullets, where Mayakovsky was sticking his agitational posters against the Entente. The Song of the Flea, the White Generals, Lloyd George, Clemenceau, and Capitalism, this last being symbolized by a pot-bellied character in a top hat, smoking an enormous cigar. A small volume by Ehrensberg, now on the run, was in circulation. It was a prayer for Russia, so ravished and crucified by the revolution. Lunikarsky, People's Commissar for Public Education, had given the futurist painters a free hand in the decoration of Moscow. They had transformed the stalls in one of the markets into gigantic flowers. The great lyric tradition, hitherto confined to literary circles, was seeking fresh outlets in the public squares. The poets were learning to declaim or chant their work before huge audiences from the streets. By this approach, their personal tone was regenerated and their pres preciosity gave way to power and fervor. As autumn approached, we in Petrograd, the frontline city, sensed the return of a danger, this time perhaps mortal. True enough, we were accustomed to it. In Tallinn, Revel, Estonia, a British general was setting up a provisional government for Russia, at whose head he placed a certain Mr. Ly Lyasinov, a big oil capitalist. That at any rate was not dangerous. In Helsinki, the exiles had a white stock exchange where they still quoted banknotes bearing the Tsar's effigy. This was pretty good since we used to print them specially for the poor fools. Here, too, they sold the real estate of Soviet towns and the shares of socialized enterprises. A ghost capitalism was struggling to survive over there. That was not dangerous either. What was really dangerous was typhus and famine. The red divisions on the Estonian front, exposed to lice and hunger, were demoralized. In the shattered trenches, I saw emaciated, dejected soldiers, absolutely incapable of any further effort. The cold rains of autumn came, and the war went by dismally for those poor fellows, without hope or victories or boots or provisions. For a number of them, it was the sixth year of war, and they had made the revolution to gain peace. They felt as though they were in one of the rings of hell. Vainly, the ABC of Communism explained that they would have land, justice, peace, and equality when in the near future the world revolution was achieved. Our divisions were slowly melting away under the ghastly sun of misery. A most mischievous movement had grown up inside the armies engaged in the Civil War, white, red, and the rest, that of the Greens. These borrowed their title from the forests in which they took refuge, uniting deserters from all the armies that were now unwilling to fight for anyone, whether generals or commissars. These would fight now only for themselves, simply to stay out of the civil war. The movements existed over the whole of Russia. We knew that in the forests of the Peskov region, the Greens' effective forces were on the increase, numbering several tens of thousands. While organized, complete with their own general staff and supported by the peasants, they were eating the Red Army away. Cases of desertion to the enemy had also been multiplying ever since it became known that the generals were giving white bread to their troops. Fortunately, the caste outlook of the officers of the old regime neutralized the trouble. They persisted in wearing epaulets, demanding the military salute, and being compulsorily addressed as your honor. Thus exhaling such a stench of the past that our deserters, once they had fed themselves, deserted again and came back to receive a pardon if they did not join the Greens. On both sides of the front line, numbers fluctuated constantly. On October 11th, the White Army under General Yudinich captured Gamberg on the Estonian border. In fact, it encountered hardly any resistance. Our skeletons of soldiery, or to be exact, all that was left of them, broke and fled. It was a nasty moment. General Denikin's National Army was now occupying the whole of the Ukraine and on the way to capturing Oral. Orel. Admirable, or Admiral Kolchak, 
the supreme head of the counter-revolution, was in control of all Siberia and now threatened the Urals. The British occupied Archangel, where one of the oldest Russian revolutionaries, Tchaikovsky, a former friend of my father, presided over a democratic government that shot the Reds without quarter. The French and Romanians had just been chased out of Odessa by a black anarchist Amory, army, but a French fleet was in the Black Sea. Soviet Hungary had perished. In short, when we drew up the balance sheet, it seemed most probable that the revolution was approaching its death agony, that a white military dictatorship would soon prevail, and that we should be all hanged or shot. This frank conviction, far from spreading discouragement, galvanized our spirit of resistance. My friend Mazin, Lichtenstad, went off to the front after a talk we both had with Zinoviev. The front line is everywhere, we told him. Out in the scrubland or the marshes, you will die soon and without achieving anything. Men better fitted for war than you are needed for that, and there is no shortage of them. But he insisted. He told me afterwards that since we were facing utter ruin and were probably doomed, he saw no point in gaining a mere months, a mere few months reprieve for his own life, doing jobs of organization, publishing, etc., which were fruitless from now on. And that at an hour when so many men were dying quite uselessly out in the wilds, he felt a horror of smallly offices, committees, printed matter, and the Hotel Astoria. I argued with him that it, it was our overriding duty to hold on, to live, not to expose ourselves to danger except in the direst necessity, that we would have a chance to get ourselves killed by using up the last bullets. I had just returned from what was a more or less deadly mission cut short by Bucharin. I had not felt fear, nor was I afraid to show fear, but I did realize that there was so many reasons to go on fighting that even intelligent heroics appeared absurd to me. I imagined that the war service of this myopic intellectual absent-minded over the smallest things was destined to last a fortnight at the most. Mazin Lichtenstad departed and made war for a little longer than that. Zinoviev, doubtless wishing to save him, had him appointed political commissar to the 6th Division, which was barring Udenich's path. The 6th Division broke under fire and was overwhelmed. Its remnants fled in disarray over the sodden roads. Bill Shatov, scandalized, showed me a letter from Mazin that said, The 6th Division no longer exists. There is only a fleeing mob over which I have no more control. The command no longer exists. I demand to be relieved of my political functions and given a private rifle. He is mad, Shatov exclaimed. If all our commissars were so romantic, a fine state we should be in. I'm giving him a dressing down by telegram, and I won't mince my words, I assure you. What I saw of the rout made me understand Mazin's reaction. There's nothing like a defeated army overcome by panic, sensing betrayal in the air. It ceases to obey orders and becomes a herd of frightened men, ready to lynch anyone daring to stand in their way, flinging their weapons into the ditches. Such a feeling of hopelessness emanates from it, and nervous panic is so subtly and savagely contagious that those who still have courage are left only with the despairing option of suicide. Vladimir Os Osipovich Mazin did as he had written. He renounced his command, picked up a rifle, collected a little band of communists, and tried to stop both the rout and the enemy simultaneously. There were four of these determined comrades on the edge of a forest. One of the four was his orderly, who had refused to desert him. These four engaged in furious combat, alone against the white cavalry, and were killed. Much later, some peasants pointed out to us the spot where the commu commissar had fired his last bullets before falling. They had buried him there. Four corpses dried up by the earth were taken back to Petrograd. One of them, a little soldier beaten to death with a rifle butt, his skull battered in, was still making to protect his face with his stiffened arm. I identified Mazin by his fine fingernails. A former prisoner from Schlüsselburg identified him by his teeth. We laid him in his grave in the field of Mars. This was after our victory, a victory that I think none of us then believed in. 
Naturally, like all the comrades, I performed a host of functions. I ran the romance language section and publications of the International. I met the foreign delegates who kept arriving by adventurous routes through the blockade's barbed wire barrier. I carried out a commissar's duties over the archives of the old Ministry of the Interior, i.e. the Okhrana. I was at the same time a trooper in the Communist Battalion of the 2nd District and a member of the Defence Staff, where I was engaged in smuggling between Russia and Finland. From honest dealers in Helsinki, we would buy excellent weapons, Mauser pistols in wooden cases, which were delivered to us on a quiet sector of the front, quiet because of this minor traffic, 50 or so kilometers from Leningrad. To pay for these useful commodities, we printed whole casefuls of beautiful 500 ruple notes, watery in appearance with the image of Catherine the Great and the signature of a bank director as dead as his bank his social order, and the Empress Catherine. Case for case, the exchange was made silently in a wood of somber furs. It was really the maddest commercial transaction imaginable. Obviously, the recipients of the imperial banknotes were taking out a mortgage on our deaths, at the same time furnishing us with the means for our defense. The archives of the Okhrana the late political police of the autocracy, presented a serious problem. In no event were they to be allowed to fall again into reactionary hands. They contained biographies and even excellent historical dissertations on the revolutionary parties. If we were to undergo a defeat followed by white terror and illegal resistance, for which we were making preparation, the whole collection would provide precious weapons for tomorrow's hangmen and firing squads. To add another relatively minor inconvenience, some scholarly and sympathetic activists or archivists who also anticipated our coming end were surreptitiously pilfering these stirring old documents out of an entirely admirable concern to see that they were not destroyed. There were no railway trucks to convey them to Moscow in no time either since Petrograd might fall any week now. While barricades were being raised at street corners, I saw to the packing of those boxes considered the most interesting, so that I could try to get them out at the last moment, and I ordered arrangements to be made whereby, either in the Senate, building, or at the station itself, everything would be burnt and blown up by a squad of trusted comrades at the moment when any alternative course could cease to be possible. The archivists, from whom I concealed this plan, suspected that something was afoot and were sick with fear and vexation. Leonid Borisovich Krasin came on behalf of the Central Committee to inquire about the measures that were being taken to save or destroy the police archives, in which he was a figure of perceptible importance. A perfect gentleman, dressed in bourgeois style with a genuine concern for correctness, correctness and elegance, he passed through our headquarters, which were full of workers in cloth caps and overcoats with cartridge belts. A handsome man with a beard neatly trimmed to a broad point, an intellectual in the grand style. It was at the time of our snatched conversation so tired that I thought he was sometimes asleep on his feet. On October 17th, Yudinich captured Gatchina, about 25 miles from Petrograd. Two days later, his, adv his advance forces entered Ligovo, on the city's outskirts, about nine miles away. Bill Shatov stormed away. The principles of military science, which my experts never stopped reminding me of, required divisional headquarters to be such and such many miles from the firing line. Here we are, 200 yards away. I told him, to hell with your scientific principles. It seemed quite plainly to be our death agony. There was no trains and no fuel for evacuation, and scarcely a few dozen cars. We had sent the children of known militants off to the Urals. They were traveling there now in the first snows, from one famished village to the next, not knowing where to halt. We arranged new identities for ourselves, trying to change our faces. It was relatively easy for those with beards who only had to shave but as for the others, an efficient girl comrade, lively, lively and affable as a child, was setting up secret arms depots. I no longer slept at the Astoria, whose ground floor was lined with sandbags and machine guns against a siege. 
spent my nights with the communist troops in the outer defense. My wife, who was pregnant, resorted to sleeping in an ambulance in the rear with a case holding a little linen and our most precious possessions so that we might be reunited during the battle and fight together in the retreat along the Neva. The plan for the city's internal defense envisaged fighting along the canals, dividing the town, a stubborn defense of the bridges, and a final retreat that was quite impracticable. The huge solemn spaces of Petrograd in their pale autumn melancholy fitted this atmosphere of inescapable defeat. So deserted was the city that riders could gallop at full speed along the central thoroughfares. The Smolny Institute, once an educational establishment for young ladies of the aristocracy, now the office of the executive of the Soviet and the party committee, presented a stern picture with its show of cannon at the entrance. It is made up of two masses of buildings surrounded by gardens, standing between vast streets and the equally vast turbulence of the Neva, which is straddled not far from there by an iron bridge. There is a former convent whose Baroque architecture is charmingly ornate, standing with its church, a rather lofty building with figured belfry turrets. The whole is painted in a bright blue. Next to it is the institute proper, with pediments and columns on all four sides, a two-floor barracks built by architects who knew of nothing but straight lines, rectangle upon rectangle. The convent hosts the workers' guards, the great square office rooms whose windows overlooked, the, wa the wastelands of the dying city were practically empty, a pale, puffy Zinoviev, round-shouldered and quite spoken, and quiet spoken, lived there amidst telephones in constant communication with Lenin. He pleaded for resistance, but his voice was weakening. The most competent experts, military engineers, and former pupils of the military school, no less, considered resistance to be quite impossible and made constant reference to the massacres it would entail, just as though the city's surrender or abandonment were not bound to entail a massacre of a more demoralizing character.